Met Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you this morning, as I offer these words as sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Week after week, you and I come to church, and we affirm the faith of the church and reaffirm our own faith using uh, the words of the Nicene Creed. In fact, we will do that right after this sermon. And regardless of where uh, we are in our faith, on that day, we still say the Creed. And my guess is, as I look at you, you've all come today in different spiritual journeys and different spiritual places with different questions. And you arrive here faithfully. And we reaffirm together the faith of the church. And uh, lucky for you, uh, I will not be addressing any of the scriptures today. Uh, (laughs) But intend to speak because I'm doing a series on the Nicene Creed, uh, which you can find Uh, on a podcast, Uh, and and so I want to talk to you about where I am in in that series, and you can listen to the rest, and any hard questions, you've got a host of clergy here to answer them, because I I only have, you know, 60 minutes. (laughs) Where I am in my preaching series is this phrase, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, this is called the Ascension. He ascended, right? So we call this the Ascension. The themes of the Ascension are also mentioned throughout our liturgy. We just mentioned them in the Gloria as we sing that together. They're in the Eucharistic prayer, especially so. And let me say that they've wove themselves into the Scriptures. Come into your Master's place. You have the light. You don't have to worry, right? These were the phrases used by Paul, and these are the phrases used in the gospel. Let me say that the first followers of Jesus had an experience of Jesus's death, his resurrection, and his ascension. These are the most ancient experiences that were told about in the scriptures of Jesus. It was important enough for them to evolve and make it into the scripture after some years. Of course, if we were to look at the scriptures and open them up, there's arguably a mention in Mark's gospel at the end. There are prefiguring stories, which are often called the transfiguration stories, which hint at this coming ascension. There is this tale in the book of Acts in chapter 1. Uh, we're also accompanied, all of that then accompanied by commentary. Some of the oldest scripture in Ephesians 1.20, God raised him from the dead and set him in the right hand in heavenly places. I love that term, in heavenly places. Hebrews 9, Christ is to be found in holy places, into heaven itself appearing in the presence of God. And then 1 Peter, Christ has gone to heaven, is at the right hand of God, and all angels' powers and authorities are subject to him. There we might see Paul's idea that nothing can separate us from the love of God, no powers, authorities, because Christ is there, you see. Within a hundred years of the resurrection, the experience of Jesus' ascension, this way of speaking about his heavenly place and his departure to that heavenly place by his followers had had been made known and was being placed in God's narrative, which we received as the scriptures. The very barest meaning of this phrase in the creed is this. Jesus was resurrected and rose to heaven, ascended into heaven, and is, importantly, one with God. The language we use to describe this is difficult and at times illusory because none of us have been there yet to the heavenly places, right? So we we have to put some words around it, right? We want to describe what happened, but we're all going there. I hope the gospel might have us question, right? But we haven't been, so it's hard for us. We have to 
put words around it because we're human beings. We want to describe this good news that we've been given. Being the operative word yet here, because we're going, we're all going to die. We make this statement about the ascension in a sure and certain hope of our own resurrection. Of our own resurrection. That this statement about the ascension has also something to do with us. Our own resurrection from the dead, our own rising, and that Christ Jesus has gone before us to set a place, as the scripture says, a table for us. God has gone before us and God has, we're told, from Jesus, many mansions. Are we not? Now, I love to think when I think of the, every time I read that, the many mansions. I hear Tom Bodette's voice from that commercial. We'll keep the light on for you. So strong is our faith that we go down to the grave. We say singing what? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We don't sleep like others sleep, says the scripture today. We also use phrases like Christ is seated at the right hand of God. However, I don't have time to go into all of that today. I do want to raise a few things, though, to you, powerful things that we Episcopalians mean when we talk about this ascension to heaven and seated at the right hand of God. First, as I've said already, Christ is one with God, and there is only one God. No matter how we refer to God, God is one. This unity with God reveals to us the reality that the first followers of Jesus experience God in the person of Jesus. Right? So it is this unity of an experience with the divine in the human person of Jesus that so convinced them, so convinced them that he was God. So the ascension at once affirms Jesus as one with God in this world and the next. And there, in a theological way of speaking, we might say his human nature, Jesus' human nature, I like to think of it as as his Adamness, right, is mixed with his Godness. Uh, and thus, his life, his death, resurrection, and ascension has something to say about our humanness, right? Our Adam and Eveness. In other words, because he ascends to heaven, right, he takes a part of us with us to prepare that place. It means that here lies our hope of our own future. Hope to experience a pure unity with God when we die. It means that our prayers need no intercessor, but are directly to God. Christ is not only the great high priest for us Episcopalians, he is the only priest. He is the only, sorry, you all. He's the only priest. And I'll take just a moment to say that when we pray, all we're doing is praying for us. We are praying for us. I grew up in the church, in the Episcopal Church, and learned that, you, that I was supposed to read the prayers as the priest said them, even the Eucharistic prayer, because what the priest was doing was gathering our prayers. We do not need an intercessory, says the Scripture. So what we do as clergy is gather our prayers together, because it's by the ascension that they are received in heaven. And finally, it offers a very unique statement about baptism and Eucharist. Very mysterious statement, but orthodox. Claimed by all Catholic Christians, we proclaim in this creed, it is the church's mystery encapsulated in our sacramental theology. The church is teaching about these two sacraments. In baptism, we say we are given an outward and visible sign of our unity with Christ. Where? In his death, in his resurrection, and in his ascension. And that in the Eucharist, we've given a foretaste of the heavenly banquet, what we are about to do in just a few minutes, what we are in the process of making happen, that one with our prayer says that, and, and also that in our altar call of our faith, walk to the rail, we are participating in things to come. It's not just in this moment where we receive God's sacrament, but as we receive that, we receive, as we say, a foretaste. 
of that which is ours, which waits for us. And even in this moment participates with what is to come. The things we know not of, but the things we believe in faith that Christ Jesus taught us and that his first followers experienced. A heavenly place. And so as our prayer book says, as for me, I know that my Redeemer, Jesus Christ, lives. And that the last, he will stand upon the earth after my awaking. He will raise me up. And in my body, in that moment of ascension prepared by Jesus for all of us, in my body, I shall see God in that moment. I myself and you will see God. My eyes, we say and pray, will behold the fullness of God, who is my friend and not a stranger. No. So, I believe this. <laughs> Your bishop believes this. The church believes it with me and proclaims it every Sunday. So regardless of what question you came with today, we can hold you in your doubt and in your questions. But we believe that Christ has gone before us and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God to receive us and awaits us with open arms to welcome us into that heavenly place. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter, at Texas Bishop, and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.